Okay. That was all this media order. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the board meeting for the Wiseman Unified School District for May 9th, 2022. It is lovely to see human beings here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to our volunteer board members. Good to see you all. This Have a specialty area where they work with all elementary schools and they also have a school site where they're the lead counselor so Miss Aliyah El Osmar is our group specialist and um, she is the lead at ANZA. Miss Julie Walker is our mental health clinician and she's the lead at 138. Miss Rachel Yamada is our family support specialist and she is the lead at um, Cabrillo, she couldn't be here this evening. And then we have a dynamic um, team of counselors at Dana who are amazing at collaborating. They include Ms. Megan Engie, Mr. Ted Okasinski, and Mr. Gabriel Perlman. And then we have an honorary counselor um, who is the school psychologist at the Success Learning Center, Ms. Sarah Green. Um, a lot of her work spans social emotional support and mental health. And so she's here to present with us as well. Uh, okay. um, our counseling program aligns with our district assurances. So um, that's through the work of direct services, the use of research-based curriculum, um, consultation and collaboration with teachers and families, and then also activities on campus. Yeah, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so we'll be talking about those things today at the elementary school level, um, how it looks at Dana, and then also how it looks at the SLC. 
Next slide, please. So our elementary school counselors do an amazing job at providing direct services, but they also spend a lot of time providing universal support. So social emotional learning support that every single student receives. And they do that um, primarily through three ways. One is the integration of healthy practices. So um, our counselors regularly attend leadership meetings like Guiding Coalition and PBIS. They participate in assemblies. They promote um, activities from our acts committee, such as the Veterans Day Appreciation or a cookbook, things that everyone can become involved with in a positive way. Our counselors um, teach and they promote the practices of health of, of new skills. Um, and they do that through our second step curriculum, which is implemented weekly in our schools. And also um, through the facilitation of second step for adults, um, which directly and indirectly um, impacts our students' academic and social emotional outcomes. And then um, they also provide support for teachers and families through things like parent and caregiver workshops teacher trainings and consultation and community circles and um, co-teaching. So this is something that the co-teaching piece is something that's been done more often at the elementary school level this year, especially as it relates to diversity and inclusion. So we'll have teachers ask us to help them identify like a story that they can read in class. And so the counselor and the teacher will work together um, on identifying a story, reading that story, and then facilitating the discussion with students in the classroom. We've gotten some great feedback from that. Next slide, please. Okay, so for students who will benefit from additional support beyond those that universal level, we have our tier three and our tier two supports. And that mainly consists of skill building groups at the tier two level and then individual counseling or family counseling at the tier three level. So you can see here from these pie charts that out of the 189 counseling referrals we've received since mid-April, that um, the referrals are pretty even across school sites and across grade levels with the exception of TK. Next slide, please. This slide um, shows the breakdown of the type of services that students are receiving. So right now we have um, 244 students who are receiving services. Um, and those are individual counseling, group counseling, family counseling, some students receive multiple services, so it looks kind of like only two students are receiving or two families are receiving family support, but really most of our students who are receiving multiple services are receiving family counseling, so either their parents are receiving family counseling or the whole family unit, so parents and student, and then in addition to another service, so family counseling and group counseling or family counseling and individual counseling. Um, our school psychologists and our occupational therapists provide services our Pepperdine interns. And it's important to note that um, the Care Solace referrals, we have referred 17 families through Care Solace. That's our organization um, that helps families find community related services. So if they weren't interested in school-based or maybe school-based wasn't an appropriate service, then they're able to find a, source, a resource in the community. Um, that 17 doesn't include people who are receiving services who've also been referred to Care Solace. Next slide, please. And then just to give you an idea of our group, um, our skill building groups, these are some of the um, topics that are focused on during groups. And then the pie charts for each school show um, the continuation of services. So the red, for example, shows students who met their goals in counseling and were moved to another group after another skill set was identified that they could benefit from compared to the yellow that shows students who met their goals and then removed out of counsel, or exited out of counseling. So you can see if you combine the red and the yellow that most students are achieving their um, goals after they participate in group. And then we have the people in the blue where they might've participated in group and it wasn't the best fit and they would benefit from a service like individual counseling or family counseling. And so now I will pass it to Julie and she'll tell you a little bit about our tier three support and internship program. Thank you, Dr. Ingram. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm so excited to be back. Nice to see you all. Um, thank you. So I'm also very excited to be here to talk about our mental health training program, which has been steadily growing over the past three school years. In that time, we've been able to contract with 10 graduate schools in the Southern California area 
um, to provide intensive counseling supports to our students and their families. So this allows us to reach more students and families. Um, and next school year, we're set to take on eight, which is an all-time high. <laughs> and they will continue to help us provide that individual intensive tier three counseling support, in addition to also assisting us at the tier two counseling group level um, to allow us to comprehensively expand our counseling reach and access more students. Also, I'm a little nervous, so I have to like look at my notes to see if I forgot to say anything else. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I will pass it off to Ted Okasinski to talk about data medical school. Thank you, Julie. Hi. So yes, uh, we're going to transition uh, to Dana Middle School, and I'm going to talk about the SEL supports at Dana. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about the Tier One supports. These are the universal supports that all students receive, and then uh, Megan and Dave will talk about the more targeted Tier Two and tier three supports. So, yep, transition. Okay, so these are our three most prominent um, tier one SEL supports. Uh, to begin with, all students are taught um, SEL lessons every Wednesday. I know Monique alluded to our second step program. It's, it's that's the curriculum um, and uh, it's scripted and topics include anti-bullying, goal setting, uh, navigating social conflict, et cetera. Uh, moving clockwise there to the right, uh, we also have a very comprehensive uh, PBIS program. Um, you guys are probably familiar um, with some of our PBIS uh, activities. Uh, first off, all students are taught our pride behaviors. These are preparedness, respect, integrity, determination, and empathy. Um, and we use a wonderful program called Student Merit to reinforce uh, these behaviors. Um, and uh, further, uh, Support is provided through weekly raffles, uh, monthly behavior recognition assemblies, and then we even have a uh, merit market, which is kind of like a token economy. Uh, students can actually exchange their merits for um, tangible items. And then finally there on the bottom, our web program. Um, this is our sixth grade transition to middle school program. Um, basically, all sixth graders participate. They're, they're paired with eighth grade mentors and those mentors uh, provide support um, and events throughout the year. So that's just a highlight of our tier one um, SEL supports. So I'll pass it on to Megan to talk about tier two. Hi, um, nice and nice to see you guys. So at Dana, our main tier two counseling support are, is our caseload that we see. So between the three counselors at Dana, we are currently seeing 101 students on a regular basis. Um, currently, the, how we see these students is that this year, 35% of those referrals came through parent requests. 28% uh, were self-referrals where the students come to us and ask for counseling services. 17% of the referrals were rolled over from last year. So those students were seeing a counselor last year and we continued services for them this year. 10% were admin referrals, usually coming from a 504 IEP or SST meeting. And then 6% were teacher referrals. We see students for a multitude of reasons. Um, some students uh, suffer from anxiety, depression. We help students navigate social relationships, um, family conflict. We also help them build scope, uh, coping skills, anger management, grief, and then uh, the academic support as well. And students and families can request counseling services uh, through one of the counselors through phone or email. We're pretty flexible with that. Um, through meetings, parent conferences that they're having with the teachers, again, through 504 SST meetings. We have a paper form that all students can access during the school day in the front office. We also have that same form online on our website where parents can access it and students. And then our newest um, form this year is we have a QR code. So it's super easy where the students can kind of take the picture and, and it'll take them right to the, the counseling referral form. All right, I'll pass it to Paige. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so with the uh, tier three supports at Dana, we focus on five primary interventions and supports, the Care Solace program, our peers program, Student Success Club, Friendship Club, and Pepperdine Counseling. Um, so uh, as it's been alluded to, Care Solace is an amazing resource that the district has for our students, um, that, and they provide concierge uh, service to find mental health support outside of school. Um, for our students who need uh, on-site weekly therapy, we are partnered with Pepperdine, uh, Pepperdine's counseling program and their PhD candidates. 
um, for our students who are in need of strengthening social skills, um, we have activities, role playing, and more that is uh, fostered through the UCLA Peers Program. And our Student Success Club provides dedicated time, space, and counselor support after school. Um, so students can succeed academically when they need that extra help. Uh, our chapter of the Friendship Club targets inclusion and promotion of friendship and acceptance for both uh, special education and general education students. Um, overall, we've had 72 tier three interventions this year. And um, up next, we have Sarah. Hi, everyone. I don't know if I've met all of you, but I'm Sarah Green, so I'm the Malone School Psychologist here. Um, but I'll, I'm here to talk about Success Learning Center, um, which is the program that Wiseburn hosts for the SELPA. Um, can you advance? Awesome. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, SLC is a consortium program that's available to all districts in the Southwest SELPA. Um, so students are placed there through their IEP team at their home district. Um, and typically, the students are there because they have more behavioral or social emotional needs that can't be met on their um, more traditional school campuses. Um, so we have right now two classrooms with about 10 students each. Um, and then we also have the adult transition program Futures Plus, um, which is a little bit separate, but I work with them as well. Um, so as a school psychologist, I provide direct counseling to all of the students in some capacity, either group, individual, or a combination of both, usually. Um, and then I also collaborate often at the students' IEP meetings. Um, so I'm attending all of them, talking about progress, goals, things like that. And then I collaborate a lot with outside providers. So a lot of these students also have therapists and people they work with in the community as well. Um, so yeah, so that's just a little bit about SLC. Um, and I'm just rounding out the end of the presentation. So thank you. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions for us? Um, thank you all so much yeah. for what you do. This is, you know, my baby. I love, <laughs> I love talking about uh, social emotional learning. Um, and so I'm so thrilled that you guys have been providing the services that you do. Sorry, I get emotional about it because my own son has access to a lot of those. Okay. Um, I'm curious um, if you guys can talk a little bit more at the elementary level about how you're addressing bullying in the schools. Um, I know Dr. Inger and I have had a couple of conversations about this. I've seen several instances with my own kids um, or their friends. I'm aware of a number of um, instances of like uh, teasing around gender nonconforming behavior, especially at the elementary schools. Um, and just curious how Second Step gets um, sort of uh, generalized across, especially the elementary schools, um, because I understand like at the middle school you have the you know Wellness Wednesdays, and I'm curious how that happens at the different elementary schools too. So, sure. Um, I think with both programs, we're learning from each other um, mm -hmm. in terms of best practices. And um, Dana has some really outstanding Tier One practices, and um, we're starting to implement those um, more strongly at the elementary school level. And so, um, so yes, this is the first year where all students, all classrooms are implementing the Second Step curriculum. So we don't want to just um, we want to make sure there's a system in place that's going to be sustainable and really impactful to all students and really impact the whole community so that um, there is inclusion, right, and that bullying is not something that is acceptable um, at our schools. And so the second step curriculum, um, there's alignment in topics across or in units across grade levels. And so um, the assemblies that the school has will recognize those and, and celebrate those so that helps to bring like to build a community. But then within each grade level and those units, there are unique lessons that are developmentally appropriate. And so younger students are learning about identifying feelings, um, recognizing their emotions and eventually regulating their emotions while other students are learning about empathy and communication. And so there's this whole research-based system with Second Step um, to help with those social interactions. Um, so that's one piece. And then um, there's PBIS, which um, kind of takes activities and different incentives and programs to help infuse those concepts that are being learned in Second Step. 
um, throughout the school system. And then um, there's just, there are different components that we're trying to add in, right? And so then we're trying to address the curriculum, um, how um, everyone talks to each other, the language we use, and just create practices and norms so that bullying is not accepted. And then in those cases where um, it does happen, because that's going to happen um, kind of before we, we develop that culture, we try and address it right away um, using restorative practices so that the person who um, kind of did use, did implement, or did have that in, inappropriate behavior is learning from their decisions, repairing those relationships that they might have ruptured with, that, with whatever actions they um, did, and then making sure that the students who are, all students who are impacted, so directly or indirectly, um, are addressed as well through counseling services, but also, again, um, this is where the, the, it comes, those partnerships come in, where the counselors work with teachers and everyone's working together, so it's not just one person addressing this, but it's really going back to that systemic piece. Thank you. I want to take a moment to thank you, Dr. Ingram, and all the counselors here. Uh, uh, for the, the work, the hard work that you're doing. Obviously, you create an opportunity and the resources necessary to give these kids and, and op really an op opportunity to succeed in, uh, in the learning environment. They need that uh, special assistance. I did have two questions, one for Dr. Ingram and one for you, Megan, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one of your slides I saw an increase, Dr. Ingram, in, in first, first grade, I believe, and Megan, on yours, and I wanted to get a little more feedback on the parent referral and, sure. and student. And, and I guess the question is along the same lines, are we seeing an uptick as a result of COVID, as a result of the pandemic? Uh, I didn't see a comparison from last year, but I suspect that maybe that's what we're seeing. Yes, <laughs> there are um, a lot more students receiving services this year than they did last year. And then a lot more students receiving those um, multiple services than last year. Um, I think just generally, um, we're seeing challenges with family dynamics, which might make sense, right? Everyone's been in the house <laughs> together for two years, right? Where that um, typically wouldn't be the case, but um, definitely working on family dynamics, family systems, um, and then just students being able to transition, right, from an environment at school that they may not have been used to for the last couple of years compared to before. And um, the numbers for first grade might be higher because those students um, haven't really had potentially haven't had um, as much of a school experience, right? So some of our first grade teachers are saying, oh, things that they would have learned in kindergarten, right? Or things that we would have been able, behaviors that we might've been able to identify in preschool or red flags, weren't able, we weren't able to address those then. And so that might be one reason why we have a higher um, um, group of students in first grade than other grades. And, and speaking um, from the middle school level, um, yeah, I didn't have a slide on previous data, but it has increased. I think our students this year, with even through Carisales, um, we we have a third counselor, which has been amazing because I think our caseloads have really just been impacted by the pandemic. Um, I also think just the stigma on mental health too is kind of going down, specifically at the at the middle school level. So I think people are more likely to ask for those services, which is great. That is a positive thing. Uh, but yes, we do see our caseloads like this year compared to two years ago have um, have increased. Well, I'm glad to see that, you know, obviously with the partnerships, we're going to see more interns to, to help mm -hmm. because I know this is not easy and we're obviously dealing with kind of uncharted territory. Yeah. Um, so if there's anything that we can do from the board to help, I mean, we certainly need to especially focus on our, our real, uh, on the elementary ones. We want, we want to catch that when they're young yeah. and, and, and provide them as much assistance and support. But, but thank you, each and every one of you. I want to share a couple of things that, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, there probably has never been a, a time in the history of our district, certainly in my 20 something years here, that social emotional learning and emotional supports have been more important. Uh, also, to anybody uh, who's listening and watching, these are some of the loveliest people you will ever meet. They're just really kind, good souls. Um, our assurances, I want to talk about that very quickly. Uh, our assurances are supposed to be our guideposts and our guardrails. They're supposed to be directional as to what we do. The fact that collaboration is one of them and that the teachers and the counselors are working together, music to our ears. So thank you so much for doing that. And kudos to the teachers for their involvement in that. Last thing I wanted to ask about was just recently 60 Minutes did an expose on social emotional learning in students and uh, suicidal ideation is evidently up 50% from prior years. 
I, I noticed something in the slides that caught my interest in that of the referrals, there was no place for students referring, at least that wasn't tracked. I don't know if that's happening. I don't know if it's appropriate. Oh, let me ask the second thing, let you respond. Uh, and the second is in this expose and I've seen elsewhere is that some students who don't identify once asked do identify. And I was, I was wondering, do we have an outreach to all of our students irrespective of identification from others that would identify those students who could use support because I'm concerned about missing anybody. I think that I think if you come to the mic, because people can't oh, hear without it. Thanks. So yeah, I mean, one of the things we offer is we have a like I know you talked about bullying. We have a bully box, and only students fill out the referral. So if they're feeling bullied or if they're observing bullying, so that's one form. Um, you know, we also just promote you. You know, with our pod teachers, with morning announcements. You know, we have incident reports in 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 the front office, and students. I'm sure Blake can attest. They they feel comfortable you know, coming in and filling out. I know also one of the, the great things that Blake created was a, a QR scanner. So if students want to come and they want counseling services, they can come right up to the office. They can scan it themselves and it'll link them to a referral sheet for, and they can even choose which counselor they'd like to see. So all of those things are in place. Um, just, I'm so concerned, candidly, I'm still concerned about the student who lives in a household where the culture is not open to this and who may not feel so inclined, but if, if asked and put in front of them, would a self-identify? I, I, again, I could be way outside the ballgame here. I'm just want to make sure we don't miss anybody. It's, this is life and death stuff here. Uh, I mean, I just feel like just creating that culture helps them to self-identify. Uh, did you want to ask? Something? I was just going to say that I, I can't think of anything right now that, that is in place. Uh, to be, just be candid and honest that we do give to every single student, just at the middle school level. I don't know if it's different at the elementary. Um, so yeah, I think you're shedding light on a, on a potential um, area of definitely growth. And because I do think there are students that might not come forward. We do have a pretty good success rate with friendships where we do have friends um, come up and let us know if they're concerned about students cutting suicide ideation. We do have that at the middle school and friends are likely to step forward. I will say that within the friend group and let us know. But um, in terms of something that's officially in place, I, I think that is an area of growth. At the elementary school level, um, during the pandemic when we were home, um, we had a form online that students could fill out. It was um, it was easily accessible from schools to PIC, um, and they can they could it was a, a kid friendly survey where they could fill it out and say like I just wanted to say hi, don't 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 call me, or they could say you know yes I want someone to talk to, and sometimes kids would um, and I just need someone to say hello. There were DCFS reports that came from that and crisis assessments that came from that. So it was really useful. Now that we're back in person, it's not utilized as much. Um, typically, the, they will just kind of come up to someone, an adult, and, and ask for help or they or um, kind of have behaviors that, that show that they might need someone to talk to or some follow-up. Um, we have been working on our crisis assessment process. Um, we have assessed either for um, suicide or um, harm to others or threat to others um, over 40 times this year. And that has kind of a, um, different responses based on the severity level, right? But we have been able to work with families in that way. Um, and then one thing that we've already started to talk about for next year is how to make sure that every single student um, gets to personally meet their counselor um, at least once, but hopefully a couple of times during the year. So hopefully that would help open up that conversation and that level of comfort. <laughs> Quick point too, and I think I don't mean to, but I think you know Megan, what she shared is is great. Is that you know it is an area that we can can improve, and I would I would argue too that um, you know one of our biggest challenges across the board is how do we reach those students. So it's not it's not you know something that's specific to Wiseburn or to Dana or to, but that is something that we all just want to constantly ask ourselves: how do we reach that kid? You know, and, and I think that's something that from my experience with you know you and Ted and, and I'm sure Gabriel in middle school and then the team at the elementary. That we are asking those questions. Um, and it's just to continue to learn that, you know, mm -hmm. to continue to, to learn. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the incredibly important work you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. And you do not need to stay for the rest of the work. <laughs> 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 uh, the, uh, let's, good night. Good night, everybody.
Let's move to uh, district updates. Uh, Four point one Wiseburn facilities. Dr. Silvers, is this for you? Uh, no, no updates, Dr. Coleman. No updates. I'm I have a feeling there's more than that. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pool. Oh, okay. Um, so I did want to. I did want to share. Um, I know that there were some. There's some concern, rightfully so, about the pool and. Uh, you know, there's some information or misinformation that's going out um, on, on certain social media sites, um, just as to what exactly is going on with the pool. So I wanted to give a little bit of a, of a breakdown of where we are. And first, I, you know, I would like, I'd be remiss if I didn't share, you know, thank you to Roger uh, Bonuelos for his, you know, ongoing support through this, because it's, uh, you know, this predates um, some of us here, you know, me, me particularly, right? Um, and, and just his knowledge and, and ability to read the contracts and, and help provide some guidance there is really appreciated. So thank you, Roger, for, for doing that. Um, about uh, in April, right around the beginning of April, we did receive information from the city um, that they were forced to close the pool. Um, and that was the first information that we received as a district from the city that, the, that there was a problem of, the, of, of such, um, you know, such gravity, I guess, that, that they were going to be forced to close the pool. And so, you know, at that point, the city manager, who's a, an interim city manager at this point in the city, um, just basically indicated that they were going to find a third party to come in and check the heaters, figure out what's going on, um, and that they would provide us with an update beyond that. So, uh, you know, let's fast forward a little bit. Maybe, I'm sorry, the, the initial notice was the end of March, but then beginning of April, we did receive the findings from, uh, from this third party. Uh, there was some indication that, that maybe it was a design issue. Um, and so, and that was, again, the city hired this group design issue and that the cost to replace these heaters would be somewhere in the neighborhood of call it three eighty, four hundred thousand, and five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. Um, so uh, a significant expense, um, and one that we didn't take lightly and needed to really, um, look at and, and have, have studied. So we did send it immediately over to ArchPAC. That's the, the contractor, um, that actually installed the heater that, that built the pool, um, et cetera. So we did reach out to them, ask them to respond. We sent them that study from the city, uh, you know, not to get into too many details here and, and you know, uh, I just will belabor it, but, but just their, their response were basically contradicted to different points of the city. So there were two competing, um, competing arguments there. Uh, what we do know though, is that the district has requested on several occasions um, and over several weeks, um, copies of the logs, maintenance logs from the city related to, to a pool. And some of these are legally um, required documents. So when you start to look at pH balances of a pool, chlorine levels, um, maybe, as well as temperature, pool, uh, water temperature, um, et cetera. And so to date, we have not received those logs. Um, there's there's uh, actually really um, some some belief, at least from my part, and I'll say this just personally, that, that these don't, um, don't exist the way that they should. Uh, we would ask um, if they do, certainly we want them so that we can do a better job of identifying, exploring the circumstances related to the pool of the city. So first want to share that these logs just haven't come up. Um, we have not seen them. We did receive a couple emails with some logs from the city, uh, but it was mainly um, how, how the city had responded uh, via you know, purchases to certain items that had went wrong with the pool, not, not a log of a maintenance log per se. So, uh, you know, again, reached out again and just continuing to try and, and, and acquire these documents. Um, so, you know, it's ledger style, essentially is what we're looking for, daily ledger style. So it's really the position of the district now that the city did not have those logs and haven't been able, because they haven't been able to produce it, there's nothing that would, that would lead us to believe that they exist or that, that the pool was, um, and the heaters there were, were at least monitored in a way that would, uh, support the findings of a design issue. So really, you know, at this point, I would, I would suggest to the board, and I know that, that we've talked um, individually, some of us, that, that this isn't, uh, that we don't believe at this point that it's a design issue. There's nothing other than this, this outlier report, essentially, that, that indicates that. Um, we know that the city has also been, a bit, has been a part of this process from the beginning. So they were in early meetings, they had a consultant, uh, engineer, Etc. They were trained uh, through the process of maintaining the, the heaters and maintaining the pool, uh, various parts, various components of the pool and the, the pool working. So this has been something that, um, you know, came as a surprise to us that maybe there was a thought that the design was off. Um, you know, certainly we would have thought this would have come earlier. Um, so it still really remains that, um, you know, the truth when you start looking at our agreements with the city, our joint use agreements uh, that were approved by this board, the city's responsible for a couple things. That's the maintenance of the pool, the upkeep of, of the pool, daily operations of that pool, 
And also, you know, should there be a capital expense, I believe it even indicates ID heaters, um, furnaces, uh, uh, pumps, and those types of things, major capital expenses that the city would actually cover it, you know, if there's a delta between a reserve, a 40,000 annual reserve that the district puts in um, as per the requirement, and obviously whatever that total cost is. So in this case, I believe, and, and I'll have to bring this back to the board, I believe there's about $120,000 in that, in that account now, pending the next payment of 40,000 in October, bring that to 160, um, just several, you know, several months down the road. Um, but aside from that, so we're reaching this 500,000, you know, our belief is that regardless, the city would be responsible for doing that. And so, you know, I just wanted to share with the board, this really hasn't been a lack of, of, of effort and really trying to push this forward and get us to a point uh, where we know we want to get our kids primarily right. We want to have our kids have an opportunity to get in the pool and be able to, we know they miss swim season and, and water polo. It's really unfortunate and, and want to work with the city. So you will see an emergency resolution on, on the agenda today for consideration. I'm happy to talk about it maybe at that moment um, on the agenda, but just wanted to give a little bit more of an overview there um, as well. So I will, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. There, a quick couple of comments. Thank, thank you for the, for the, Excellent summary there, Dr. Silvers. Just wanted to share as well that uh, as far as Wiseman, we fully intend on honoring our, our portion of the joint use agreement, which is a part of, part of that is the $40,000 contribution for those capital expenditures that money is being put forward. Uh, to, for instances such as, such as this, uh, when equipment reaches its life uh, expectancy or um, what the warranties are expired, that you can never predict how long the equipment is going to last, but you certainly would um, extend the life of any kind of equipment, just like we do with our cars by getting an oil change on a very regular basis by doing the basic maintenance. When that makes maintenance isn't done, then the life expectancy of any equipment drastically diminishes as well. So um, we fully in intend on honoring our portion of the, of the agreement as we would expect the city also going to also honor their portion of it. Um, the, in terms of the maintenance, the first term of uh, the agreement is that the city would maintain the pool um, and, and, uh, and also administer it in terms of the, through their rec and parks for the first term, which is 25 years, is the agreement and then there's options to renew and continue that service. So we certainly appreciate the, uh, um, uh, the joint use agreement with the city and look forward to having that pool um, fixed as soon as possible with the heaters. That's why you see the, uh, the emergency board resolution on tonight uh, to try to help and expedite, expedite that as, as best we can um, and work with the city to get it done. Thank you, Roger. Anything else on facilities, Dr. Silvers? No, I did want to share, and I don't know if uh, some of the trustees want to share. I want to thank the community uh, for um, those that were able to come out to our facilities master planning committee meeting just last week. I, I believe it was the last week. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, you know, last week we were able to have this, this plan. I want to thank Brianna Contreras for, for helping support this process and getting everybody together. Um, you know, it's not easy getting, you know, hosting one of these. Um, but really, thank you, thank you to the trustees here for, for joining us for that meeting. I think it was really good conversation to be able to, to talk about our facilities again and, and see some of the future goals, aspirations, not only of the community, but also in relationship to what the district and, and staff feel is, is important for our students and our community moving forward as well. Um, really excited about how it's shaping up, really happy to, to be able to bring this back to the board on the 26th as part of a, a you know, more in-depth board workshop essentially uh, with LPA. I think uh, LPA has just really done a phenomenal job in helping uh, spearhead this process. So I'm uh, really happy and, and, uh, and, and hopeful and excited. So thank you. I don't know if there's a, uh, I don't know if you were going to say something too. I just, I didn't get a good job if you were. No, no, I think uh, I'll mention something under, from the board. Yeah. That's it, Dr. Goldberg. All right, thank you, Dr. Silvers. And also in the uh, share your thoughts comments, there was a comment I neglected to mention was about facilities but regarding the importance of fields and uh, open space, yeah. um, which I believe was reflected in the comments by all the participants as well. So uh, thank you for your, again, participation if you came and uh, we, we're using that as, as part of our deliberations here. We next move to 4.2, uh, Wiseburn University School, uh, University, Wiseburn Unified <laughs> School District. I'm elevating them. Uh, and uh, the DD partnership. Uh, a couple things to, to announce here. Uh, one is a shout out and thank you to Jennifer Morgan, who is uh, retiring from the board, from the uh, Da Vinci board. I believe she was a founding board member of Da Vinci and has served since its origins, uh, dedicating hundreds of hours, thousands of hours probably. And uh, we wish her well. 
in, uh, in her future endeavors. We thank her for her service. And at this time, uh, there is an application through Da Vinci for a new board member. There will be two board members from Da Vinci and two board members from Weisberg that will collectively decide on the candidate to present to each board for approval. Uh, we need at this time to choose our board members. Joanne Canetta, who is not here, expressed her interest in being one of those, uh, interest from any of the others of us, and if not, I would be happy to do so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> happy to, happy to, to, <laughs> to not to, to just give it to me. Right. Well, in my hope is for time. Uh, I'd be happy to be honored to, to help choose her replacement on the DB board to be a part of that. So I will do that. Uh, secondarily, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Joanne. And, and Ms. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, secondarily, that the, we were still in our alignment partnership communication meetings with our two by two meetings. We have scheduled those. Um, we're still sort of trying to schedule one. Uh, we've had one of the meetings. Yes. Uh, I think, I think facilities and finance we've had one meeting and the next one is scheduled for May 20th. Okay. And we have May 24th scheduled for our next meeting for uh, governance and the objective and the good faith objective in all, in all these meetings is to start with, Hey, a win-win scenario for everyone and moving us forward. So we're progressing a little slower than perhaps we'd like, but we are moving in the right direction. 4.3, the Wiseburn Education Foundation. Uh, Rebecca, why don't we turn to you for that? Sure. Uh, so just wanted to thank the entire community for coming out to rock around the block on April 30th. I know that the um, Education Foundation Board put in many, many, many hours um, into making that event a success. And, um, and I know that they are also meeting tonight to sort of hash out like exactly crunching those final numbers and everything. So hopefully at our next board meeting, we'll have those fabulous things to report, but in general, there were um, more people than I've ever seen out there. You heard from some longtime residents, more people than they've ever seen out there. Um, was wonderful to have the um, elementary music program participate this time. It was the first time in the history of Rock Around the Block that we've been able to have the, um, like a, a full program um, for those younger students. And, um, and I'm sure that there will be um, more of that in years to come and uh, with some lessons learned about how we get all the students to perform <laughs> um, there. Um, but it was wonderful and they sound, I mean, at the end of the day, they sounded beautiful. Um, so kudos to all of the teachers um, in our music program from, from all the way from TK to, to 12 who um, are doing a wonderful job for our students and to the Education Foundation for um, for really putting on an event that truly brings the community together. Um, both our businesses, our local businesses who sponsored it, thank you to all of them, and to all the community members that came out and supported it, and Dr. Silvers for getting in the dunk tank again. This year. <laughs> 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 Along with all a, a bunch of other folks, um, I begged out because I had a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was I was strong armed by all the rest of my board members not to do it. <laughs> I was ready to. Um, so, but it was a wonderful event, and and we're really looking forward to seeing um, you know how it how it shakes out at the end of the day. But we raised a lot of money um for for our students and to support all those wonderful programs and um, the STEAM education. So, thanks to everybody that came out. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, by all accounts. Uh, the most successful one ever uh, in terms of attendance, hopefully financially, but uh, thank you all. Dr. Silvers? Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I, I appreciate um, the conversations about, about music and, and really looking at how we can, um, you know, it was hard to, hard to guess, you know, I guess, how many students would show up, and it was just amazing to see, you know, 200 plus, you know, TK, TKK, you know, one and two students actually show up and be a part of it, and, and you know, it just despite the crowd and the large number of kids, it just was so, uh, it was cute and, and, and really amazing to see them out there. So um, I wanted to say that. I also want to give a shout out to Ray Santiago, the Vinci board. I think he spent an hour and a half in the dunk tank. I mean, I, I mean and, and for someone who spent 20 minutes or 30 minutes, I mean, it, it, it is wearing. I don't know how he did it, but, but you know, the kids had a blast. You know, he was teasing them and, and kind of, uh, you know, messing with them. So it was, uh, it was fun to watch that process. So anyway. Yeah. Just, just I want to say. Thank you to the swim team at Da Vinci for stepping in um, to fill in all the gaps times uh, in the dunk tank too. And all of the other Da Vinci students that came out 
to support the different, uh, having the different sports teams and others, um, both volunteering and running games and all of that. It, it really was a community event and it was great. So um, thanks again to the board of the Wiseboro Education Foundation for continuing to put on such an amazing event. It was awareness for school. Thank you. The WEP is uh, led by volunteers and till its president, just like this board, all volunteers. They serve three purposes, to build community, to raise funds and support services, and that's why they donated the musical instruments to our schools and such an impact. And again, volunteers, thank you all WEP folks out there for all you do. Super appreciate it. I'd also like to thank all the WEF board members for their contributions. That was a fantastic rock around the block. I have never seen it so packed. <laughs> and also, as you were walking uh, uh, through the through the many people, couldn't help but noticing how many little ones there are out there. There was a lot of strollers and a lot of uh, uh, little ones just learning to walk, I think. So it's really encouraging in terms of our community seeing the, the potentially the future students that are going to be coming here to the Wiper Unified School District. It's really, really a beautiful community event. So I wanted to thank all the all the volunteers uh, for contributing all of their time to make that event happen really helps us to bring our community together. So it's a beautiful, beautiful event. Um, also like to thank, uh, give a special thank you to uh, council member Alex Montero. He's uh, from the, the Hawthorne City Council. He attended and presented a, a resolution or it's a proclamation, I think, right? Yeah. In appreciation of the event. He's always been a positive supporter of our schools as a city council member. So I thought I'd recognize him for his visit. He spent a, a good hour or so and, and uh, talking to us about the status of the city, but also wanted to learn about uh, what we're doing with our schools. And he absolutely loved the music program, as you mentioned, Rebecca. So thank you to uh, Mr. Monteo for joining us that day. Mm -hmm. I was gonna save it for the, uh, the board report, but I figure we'll, we'll do it now. I also wanna take a moment to thank the uh, Weisberg Ted Foundation for the wonderful event, event uh, the Rock Around the Block. And, one of my, my favorite uh, events of the year brings the community together. And obviously, more importantly, we get to see the kids, uh, the kids perform. Um, as as um, I think all of my colleagues have alluded, it was probably the biggest turnout I've seen in, in, in my time here. And I've attended the majority of the Rock Around, the, Rock Around the Block events. I think that goes to, to show it, what I think Rebecca mentioned is the music program is extended down to the elementary level. Um, I think we need a bigger stage. If there's anything that we can do to help the Wiser and Ed Foundation, I would love to do that. And I really wanted to, I, I think I, 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 I echo everyone's comments here, but what Neil said is I wanted to really take an opportunity to say thank you to the Wiser and Ed Foundation uh, members, um, obviously under Ann's uh, leadership, because um, I know with that, the kind of turnout that, that occurred uh, that they probably had to make a lot of adjustments uh, that day and um, I, I just appreciate all the work there's a lot of work and effort that goes into that um, along with all the, uh, the the volunteers and so forth so to, uh, from the bottom of my heart thank you to them for the work and Neil I know you weren't there but you were there uh, uh, in spirit um, and I also want to thank you because you're obviously one of the founding fathers of the Wise Journey thank you white hair so, approved <laughs> and, 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 and con congratulations to the uh, 20, their 25th birthday, so. Pretty tight. That's well, all well, thank you, thank you to them. We'll move on um, from WEP and go to our board updates and uh, we'll start with our vice president. Oh, shit. Mr. Martinez. Yes. That's right. <laughs> that was gonna be nice. so, okay. so it's been a uh, busy time of the year, uh, but it's good. I think it's a, May is a good month where we get an opportunity to kind of reflect on the, on the work that's taking place and, and really celebrate the, the the work of the kids and just the events that take place like we just talked about rock around the block. So I had an opportunity to attend the Anza open house, which is wonderful. Um, it's been a while since I've been in the classroom and not seen the dividers and the, just the kids without mask and, and, and just enjoying themselves and, 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 and illustrating their work, uh, which was great to see. And more importantly, the parents, I, I talked to one of the parents that had never been to the classroom and, 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 and their, their son or daughter I think was in second grade. So um, it was just great to see the parents and being able to be, be in the classroom and, and see the, the good work that is taking place, that their students are doing. Um, I already mentioned Rock Around the Block. I unfortunately due to work commitments, I didn't have a chance to, to attend the Burnett and Cabrillo and the Dana SLC. So I 
apologize for that, but I'm sure we'll hear from my colleagues that did attend uh, those, and I'm sure those went just as well. Um, facilities master plan update, we had a, as Blake mentioned, I think, um, I, I think that that update was necessary. It's been two years since we've kind of gone back to the community and shared what our plans are. Um, and I, I did see the share, share your thoughts comment. And I think that what, that resonated even that day with a lot of our community that do, do want to see more um, uh, recreational equipment fuel space. And I think um, that was indicated in the plans by LPA. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I think the one important uh, uh, note to mention here for those that weren't at the facilities master plan update and for the community is that there are some mandate requirements that are being imposed on the district with preschool <laughs> before and after school program, mandatory requirements that are gonna require more facilities. And that is being incorporated in the facility master plan update. So take a look at that, more to come on that. Um, I think our consultant LP is doing a great job. And like Blake said, I think there'll be uh, a presentation here in the next few weeks. So more to come on that. So keep, uh, keep in tune for that. Um, as I mentioned with um, some of the things to celebrate, I, I just wanted to mention, we Dimitri just had the senior awards um, uh, high school. I, I was, I had a chance to attend that, it was well attended. Uh, fortunately, my son Aiden uh, received the senior awards, uh, uh, senior award that evening, which is great. And um, taking every opportunity to do things right now with him because he's uh, obviously committed and getting ready to go to San Jose State. He's going to be a Spartan, so we're excited about that. But at the same time, we're trying to grab every moment we can with him right now. Um, high, the high school just had their prom as well, uh, which was uh, fantastic and held here locally at the Proud Bird, uh, which was uh, great. Um, an, another event that, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we weren't able to do. So it's been been two years. So it's nice to see some of these events coming back. And I wanted to take a moment also to congratulate the boys volleyball, uh, went to the semifinals. They unfortunately lost in the semifinals, but got to the semifinals in CIF. And uh, our baseball team uh, just won in the first round and that they're advancing the second round. I think there might be a game next week. I mean, not, not next week, tomorrow, I think, tomorrow. And they play, I think, in Lakewood. Um, so congratulations that is, uh, sports is alive and well at Da Vinci. So we've done great. And then um, the only other, the only other item I had is I wanted to also take an opportunity to thank Jennifer Morgan, who grew up here in Weisburn, attended the Weisburn schools. And um, obviously, as, uh, as Neil said, is retiring from the Da Vinci board. Wanted to thank her for her service and, and time. And um, that's it. Busy month. Busy month. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Ms. Manuelos. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see here. Let me see. Uh, last few weeks, I had an opportunity to attend the uh, 138th Street Open House, Anza, and also at Cabrillo. So it's really exciting to pack two weeks, but uh, it's really wonderful to be able to go back to the school sites and, and see, see, our, see our students and our teachers and how they interact and see the classrooms again the project assignments. And I gotta tell you, I love when uh, in some classrooms, I've seen some of the videos, some teachers post a video and you see the interaction with the students as well. And the, it's just kind of like a rolling shot, rolling screen. So it's nice to see the energy, the excitement of the kids as if they were in class. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to see. And as uh, Nelson mentioned, uh, some of the parents and that I spoke to as well, um, it's the first time they're back to school, like to, to actually attend an open house. So I know it's a lot of work and effort from, uh, from the part of our teachers to put it together. So I did want to say thank you to our teachers and our administration as well for making that happen because it really, again, it goes back to that sense of community, right? Where, where does my son or daughter uh, go to school? And they want to see the classrooms as well. So I want to say thank you to, to everyone that participated in making the open houses happen. So thank you for that. Um, next item, just briefly wanted to mention about the town hall for the master plan. Um, our intent as part of the board, I, I think uh, the um, comment we shared with my colleagues, our desire is to include as many people in the information for what's about to come or what's being planned with the facilities master plan. We want everyone's input because these are the community schools. We want to hear what you have to say, which is why we wanted to have a town hall to try to make it as inclusive as possible and create a forum 
to receive that input. So thank you to LPA because I think they did a really nice job in the overall presentation. I, and I really like that setup where they had at the end, they gave different like stickers and stars so that everyone can go around and look at each school site and put like their preferences and can, so we can get a gauge as to what's important to the community. I thought that was a very worthwhile assignment. So I wanted to recognize LPA for that. Hopefully that uh, I would expect, I should say, that that's gonna lead to better and more informed decisions from, uh, from our end as to what the community is really looking for in terms of the future <coughs> facilities. Um, Next um, next week on the, um, is that the, the May 16th, there's a LASHTA, um, LASHTA meeting, LA County Schools Trustees Association, and it's election night, and it's going to be held here at the Manhattan Beach Library. So it's, as a Wiseburn representative, I'll be attending that uh, to cast a vote for, for Wiseburn and those elected uh, officials uh, as they serve their tenure at the Board of Directors for LASHTA. So that's on the uh, May 16th at 6 p.m., and that's all I have. Thank you, Roger. Ms. Amber. Uh, thank you. So I already talked about Rock Around the Block, yay, again. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> second, Roger's comments about the uh, the open houses. It was wonderful to attend. I attended the ones at uh, 138th Street and at Cabrillo. I was in my sick phase um, for the one at Anza, so I wasn't able to go to that one. But um, but the ones that I did attend were were really wonderful. It was great to, to just be able to walk around the classrooms and see all the wonderful work that the students are doing and, um, and that the teachers are supporting in that learning and growth and um, to be on campus again um, with, with the families. So, um, so thank you for that. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention that um, I serve as the district's representative to the Community Advisory Council of the Southwest SELPA. SELPA stands for the Special Education Local Plan Area. Wiseburn is one of 12 uh, school districts uh, within the Southwest SELPA. Um, there's 135, I think, of these regions across California that serve to help administer the funding that goes towards special education services within our district. Um, today was the business meeting for the Community Advisory Council, um, and we discussed the plan, the draft um, sort of budget for next year. And I think Wiseburn stands to get about uh, a, close to $2.4 million um, from SELPA that helps with the um, special education services. And, um, and I think one of the other things that I just want to mention about it is that, you know, the SELPA is there to provide services also to the families. And so if you have a student with special needs, you can go on their website and um, they provide um, a, a whole, whole host of things from webinars and um, meetings where they provide special education services, um, uh, where they provide information about the services that are offered in the schools, um, as well as helping um, families sort of navigate the IEP process and, um, and provide mediation services, all kinds of things like that. So um, just want to make sure that the, that the folks in our community, as the community rep um, on, on the SELPA, uh, on the Community Advisory Council, that folks know that, that the SELPA exists um, and, that, um, and that there's information there um, for them. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service there. Um, I have about 35, 40 minutes of comp. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, I'll be brief in light of the wonderful things my colleagues have said. Uh, as to open houses, just a kudos and thank you to the teachers. Uh, really fun to visit and see the children, the students light up in sharing their work with their parents. There's just not much more joyful than that. Um, I want to mention the renaming meeting and thank you to Dr. Ingram for setting that up. I thought that was exceptionally well done. I know Dr. Silver, she'll be mentioning a little on that, so I won't go on. Uh, I also wanted to get, uh, do a heads up and a cautionary note that June 9th is a Dana, sorry, Da Vinci graduation and a scheduled board meeting. I suggest we find a new date for our board meeting so that we can attend. We have been asked to attend as we are every year, and that is quite an honor and privilege I'd like to take advantage of. Uh, what was it going to be at the board meeting anyways? <laughs> well, that settles it then. <laughs> uh, finally, one thing I want to just throw out there that I'm very proud of our assurances and the work we've done collectively and collaboratively to determine our future. Something I'm going to be betting with each one of you individually that I'm going to be presenting at a future joint board meeting is the idea of something I'm calling that could evolve Vision 2035 which is the idea of where do we, what do we look like? What's our ultimate goal in 2035 of becoming the most 
superlative, exceptional educational institution in America. How do we get there? Uh, what does that look like? I see that as a joint effort with Da Vinci, so K through 12 plus, and working together collaboratively to make this an even better, exceptional place uh, beyond already the great things we have happening today. What does that look like together? I see that as, as cabinet work more than our work, but nonetheless, want to challenge us to get there. I welcome your thoughts. Premature now, but just want to throw that idea out. With that, let's go to our cabinet. Uh, the Director of Psychological Services, Ms. Mazzarella, come to the mic if you would. And thank you, by the way, for all your accounting and finance work <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Thank you. And um, thank you, Ms. Uh, Kathy, for uh, explaining what SELPA is, because I'm about to say that we, I just wanted to share with everyone that um, we had four principals and Dr. Ingram and Kim Jones and myself attend a SELPA provided training, uh, inclusive education training for administrators was the title that it. it was two full days that, that we all attended. Like I said, the four principals went as well, which was very exciting. This is a real busy time of year for them and to get them all there was, was pretty impressive. The topic was, and it was April 28th and 29th on Zoom, and the topic uh, was obviously inclusive education, but it was focusing on inclusive practices for all students, not just students with disabilities, and uh, with an emphasis on co-teaching. So it was real nice. You know, we have co-teaching. Uh, they're really doing that at Dana, and we're, we're looking at doing, uh, you know, working that into the elementary levels, but that was a great um topic to be, you know, to, to get going on. And then there's a training in August for teachers to attend. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Our assistant soup of human resources, Dr. Dougal. Good evening, everyone. Um, you may have missed my COVID update the last couple board meetings, but they're back. <laughs> um, just a reminder for the community members, board members, all of our staff is that um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we are required to follow LADPH's guidelines and protocols that they put in place. And so last week, there was a new exposure management pro protocol put in place. Um, it went into effect on May 4th. Uh, we sent emails out to community members, to parents, as well as to our staff on what that um, looked like. And the biggest change was who would be identified as a close contact. Um, and the biggest change here is that close contacts are now those that you share um, indoor airspace with. So think of a classroom or a cafeteria, a gym. So anyone that you share an indoor airspace with for more than 15 minutes um, and a that someone tests positive in that indoor airspace, then you are considered a close contact. Um, so what that means for those that were in that indoor space is that they are required to wear a mask indoors for the next 10 days. So if there is a positive case, say in room 20, then for the next 10 days, all the students in room 20 are required to wear a mask and they are required to get tested. And the testing, uh, we let parents know that we still have Folgent testing Monday through Thursday at our sites from 12 to 6.30. We also send home test kits if parents need them, or our health clerks have been phenomenal at testing kids right at, at school property as well. And so once again, the two requirements, masking, and they must take a test three to five days from the date of exposure. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've also always been reporting all of our positive cases to Department of Public Health. Um, I am not a physician nor a health uh, department official, and so I do not, or we as a district, uh, do not make the calls on when there's an outbreak or when a classroom needs to shut down. Uh, we report everything to DPH. Um, they follow up uh, with questions for me and also to the positive cases. I do have to provide phone numbers and email addresses and such. And then they determine, once again, DPH determines when cases are epidemiologically linked. Um, I know in the past, and when I mean past, this was like last year, um, it was, uh, you know, the, it was if there's three cases in a classroom within 14 days, it was considered an outbreak. The terminology within the last year has changed that they have to be epidemiologically linked. And once again, I'm not the healthcare professional. And so they let us know and they link, they, they figure out if these cases are linked and when there is an outbreak. Um, and finally, since the surge in January, um, we have been updating our COVID dashboard on Mondays. And so our communications uh, person, Erica Porter, 
and I work together and I let her know what the cases are and she updates that we, uh, weekly on the um, website. Uh, but parents and staff members do rest assured that every time there is an, um, a positive case, there is a letter that goes out to the entire community or the school community. And then there's a letter that goes out to every parent in the classroom of the positive case. And so we do keep everyone informed um, of these positive cases. Uh, we do hope that, that this will soon kind of become another just thing that we can look in the past. But as of right now, uh, we are continuing to follow the protocols and continuing to um, ensure that our students are safe on our campuses. So I understand that there were <clears throat> some cases at Cabrillo last week. Um, and in particular, there was a classroom that had a, a high number of absences. And I understand we're following Department of Health guidelines and things like that. But is there a point at which we as a district should be looking at whether a classroom needs to shut down because there are an excessive number of absences? Yeah. So um, I will say the case at Cabrillo is um, per DPH is has moved from monitoring to under investigation. So which means they are, you know, kind of all hands on deck are investigating the situation. So most of our cases remain in the open slash closed monitoring, but this is the first time that we have had a case that's gone to under investigation. Um, I will find out what that means. Uh, they have been in contact with me today. I have provided additional information, but at this time um, we, we are to have that class remain open. Um, but I will say, Going back to the protocols is that that masking is, is, is a really um, important safety precaution we take once there is a positive case in the classroom, um, as well as encouraging parents to please not just get tested if you've been exposed, but take, take advantage of our weekly testing that we have available. Is that classroom, are they in the protocol of needing to wear masks now? Or Correct, since last know? Wednesday, uh, the protocol did go into place on uh, May 4th, last Wednesday. So any classroom that has a positive case for the next 10 days, they do need to wear a mask. Thanks, Dr. Google, for the update. Have we seen um, an uptick since the spring recess? I, I know I've been notified by the high school and they seem like um, I've, got, I've received those notifications quite frequently um, after the spring recess. Are we seeing a, a similar thing? Yes, that? we are. There, there has been an uptick. Um, and, and it could be spring recess, but it can also just mean there, there has been an uptake countywide of cases. Um, we are almost at a 2% positivity rate across the county, which, which is going, it's starting to increase again. So Dr. Dugo, what is, to the best of your ability or knowledge, I should say, what does the investigation entail? Is that an email request from LA, the LA County Department of Public Health asking you or our staff for more information? Do they actually investigate as in come and see and verify tests or they're just, what do, where does it go? So when I, um, when, when I say I update DPH on um, all of our positive cases, and so they actually ask for demographic information, right? So address, um, birth date of child, phone numbers and such. They also call the positive cases, mm -hmm. kind of I find out where have you been, right? Were you at a big event on Saturday night, right? Who else was there? What else happened, right? Where, did you have a big soccer tournament going on? So they're, they're trying to link the cases where it may not be at school that the spread is happening. It could be an outside entity or is the spread actually happening on campus, right? And that's when um, you would consider it an outbreak and they need to shut down. And in the case of Cabrillo, like that's in the classroom where the students have to wear masks. What happens in like recess and outside? They're not required to wear masks anymore? Not required. So the masking is required um, indoors, indoors. Um, indoors um, and obviously when you're actively eating or drinking indoors, our students do eat outdoors. And so the outdoor masking isn't required. It is strongly recommended. Um, and our parents have done a phenomenal job of kind of following through not just requirements, but also strong recommendations. Now, it's also my understanding, <clears throat> and again, I, you know, I don't think I'm wrong on this, but, but having talked to superintendents locally that just because a, a, a classroom or a particular area is considered as an outbreak, if an outbreak were determined um, you know, at, a, at a particular classroom, doesn't mean that, that it was automatic to shut down that classroom. It just means that then the Department of Public Health would, based on their investigation, would determine what steps were needed in order to best protect that, that classroom. So sometimes I've heard, you know, mandatory, um, which it is now, but mandatory masking. Um, it could be that 
uh, those students can't participate in any extracurricular activities at the school site. So I know that they've cut some of that. They've limited uh, volunteers to the classroom if there's PTA volunteers in classrooms or um, during open house, there were some outbreaks in, in local districts and they only allowed like one parent to attend an open house with a particular group that may have been determined as an outbreak. So there's other mitigation strategies I know that DPH is looking at. In fact, to date, it's my understanding the last, the worst case scenario is obviously the shutting down of the classroom and they're trying to limit the times that they actually shut down the classroom. So um, unless I'm, I, I think I've, I've yep, captured it. Is, yep. And then one last thing you mentioned, um, testing, what about vaccinations at our sites? Is that still ongoing? Uh, we did have a vaccination clinic at Rock Around the Block. Um, don't think it was very highly attended, uh, <laughs> but we do hope um, as boosters, you know, if there are additional regulations passed where others may be able to get a second booster, uh, we may be hosting more clinics. So we're not currently hosting it. We, we don't currently have any. Yeah. Will we host them for the, um, the younger, you know, once the elementary guidelines come out. So, so that's been our biggest push is when there is a new requirement or a new um, authorization by FDA. That's when we seem to get our biggest um, crowds to come out. So last November and December, if you remember when the ages five and up were approved, we had the Dana gym completely packed, right? So we're hoping if, if there's additional authorizations that happen that we would be um, on target with Holchip to host additional uh, clinics. And are we still federally funded for that, should that happen, or we don't know yet? So the vaccines, we've never had to pay for. That is something that is taken care of by the government, and we, we don't um, we don't need to foot the bill on that. It's just with the testing that um, there's a contract with, with Holgen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bugle, our assistant superintendent of educational services. I'll get it out. Dr. Good Harvick, welcome. Good evening. Thank you. You know, I wanted to go back and touch on uh, open house just briefly because we did have three open houses and student-led conferences and rock around the block bookending all these wonderful <laughs> weeks. But um, you know, despite school closure, uh, Wiseburn has been able to bring in several new initiatives this year with our teachers, good work. And anytime you bring in a new learning program, there's training, there's prep on our teachers part. Um, there's a lot of collaboration that went on. And what we saw at open house uh, and at SLCs too, was writer's workshop. We saw the CGI math learning practices. We saw SEL, our social emotional learning program come forth. And we also saw uh, so much at Dana with Reader's Workshop and other initiatives going on over there. So we're very proud of that. If you looked around those rooms, I really thank the board for being there too. It was terrific um, support. I just wanna thank our principals and our teachers for that. You know, this was a big lift this year. And I, I walked around those rooms and saw so much writing and kids so excited about things that maybe they haven't seen as really their favorite thing in the past. So just terrific work on that. Just very happy with that throughout the year. And you've heard about these programs all year. So it was good to see them come alive. Um, we also are about halfway through our CAST testing, CAST stands for the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. And this is the state mandated testing that's come back this year. So about halfway, probably the most organized testing window we've ever had. Our principals again are on top of it. Sarah Nitzo is leading that charge. We've completed also our LPAC testing, which is for our English learners. So all these results will be coming back uh, early in the summer for the LPAC and then uh, mid-August to early September for CAST. We also have our local assessments, our benchmarks going on in our K through two. They aren't tested by the state. So we have our local benchmarks end of the year going on with them. A lot of data coming to us and we'll be glad to bring that back to you this summer. Okay. So with the CAST, especially at middle school, I understand it's a lot of hours yeah. for those students. Do we provide them any extra food <laughs> we do. in the morning? That's a good question. And I just want to say there's no time limit on this test. Mm -hmm. So even though they've, uh, they've, they've lowered the number of um, items being tested on for students to lower the time this year, um, there's no time limit. So you're going to see this as an extended time. And there is food going on at every campus, and PTAs are behind that. There's a lot of support with snacks and things like that. All right, thank you. Students know that. <laughs> Hungry <laughs> middle schooler who lives in their back house. You got it. <laughs> Dr. Silvers, our superintendent. All right, I have a couple agendized items under my name there. So I'm going to, um, but I want to start with a couple updates because that's okay before I move into that. I first want to say that I, you know, I'd like to start my comments by recognizing that, you know, just last week was Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, you know, we have. Um, a lot of appreciation, you know, for our speech pathologists. Um, I believe that's May 18th. Um, is that the right? Did I get the date right? 
19th. Okay. I have a day off. Uh, May 19th, you know, to recognize speech pathologists. We also have our classified employees um, recognition um, that's coming up as well. And I, I think it just captures May in a, in a nice way, in a nice light, just to look at, you know, not only because of a pandemic, but just we saw Rock Around the Block and the music performances there and all that goes into allowing that to happen. You know, we're seeing obviously COVID issues and and the health clerks having to step into roles and maybe they're not used to in food service and, you know, the custodians and grounds crew and, and all the folks that, you know, we have our IT team that's now had to develop this online program uh, just to pr produce, you know, board meetings in a way that's um, accessible. So, you know, it's just been a, a real hands-on, you know, approach. And I, I've shared that a lot. I don't think I can overshare um, the fact that, you know, greatly appreciate, you know, our teachers uh, for the work that they've done, um, greatly appreciate our staff for the work that, that the staff has done. Um, it's just been been really remarkable. So um, definitely appreciative and, and glad we're able to, to have a resolution today to honor um, those folks too. Um, also want to share an update. Um, Eileen forgot to share it, so I'll just share it, which, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I want to give it. <laughs> no, yeah. That's the kind of support we have here. No, 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 no. <laughs> we have uh, the, the, the delay, the, the uh, dual language immersion grant that we applied for recently. Um, we've not heard yet. And we were supposed to hear, I know it's kind of like a, you know, kind of like a dun dun but I just wanted to share that, you know, we just didn't, we were expecting to hear last week on Friday, uh, we actually waited until I phone at five or six o'clock, hoping that we'd hear something, uh, come to find out there were about 125 applicants for this uh, very competitive grant, and so we're just still waiting. So, so uh, no one heard yet? No, they said they're going to now notify June, first week, second week of June, something like that. Okay, right? so we're not last to hear, we just, right. no one knows. Right, nobody knows. Right. Just, uh, so we'll see. Um, also, uh, we're coming up on, on the time that Dana Middle School will be recognized um, internationally, not internationally, nationally at the California, um, I'm sorry, the National Forum Schools to Watch um, in Washington, D.C. So a team will be, will be traveling there with Eileen, which will be nice uh, for them to get to spend some time. <laughs> um, teacher appreciate. Uh, I talked about teacher appreciation week, and now I'll move on to a couple of agenda items here. So, um, want to first start by by passing off to Greg. Um, there were some some questions. We know, luckily, we weren't we didn't have to do an official third interim this year uh, because we positively certified our budget. But we know that there were some some challenges as uh, there was some turnover in our business office. So, just wanted to Greg to be able to have an opportunity to share briefly where we're at and um, kind of next steps. Yes, thank you, Thanks. 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 Thanks too. Uh, I want to express appreciation to the team here at Wiseburn uh, District Team. Everybody's really done a great job rolling up their sleeves, digging into, well, some of the minutiae of accounting that perhaps they're not used to, but uh, they've done a great job. We're making headway on the budget and straightening, up, straightening out some of the charges that are just inherent when you have uh, the influx of the types of one-time money that you have and moving those into the proper accounting places so that we can better demonstrate your fiscal condition. And so that's going quite well. And we're very optimistic that uh, at the end of this exercise, it's going to look well for Weisburn Unified. I'll take any questions, Pat. Positive certification is always great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Um, then I'm going to ask Dr. Ingram to come up and we're going to give a presentation on the renaming. And, and so I do know. Fortunately, just because of uh, a com conflict, I wasn't able to attend, but I do want to thank Dr. Ingram for, you know, really leading that, that charge. I think it was uh, just very well received, all the feedback I received, not only from, from board members that may have been there, but also from other community members, just how great and well organized. So thank you for that. Um, all right. So basically, um, as we look, uh, you know, again, I want to thank the team for, for looking at renaming. The idea is we're moving sort of into the second phase as to you know, what, what are we going to call, you know, what, 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 is, what are going to be the names of the school? This board took action to, to rename the schools um, based on recommendations from the community advisory committee or citizens advisory committee, as well as other community members. Um, so then the next step was determining what type of name. So um, that was sort of the task that the team went, went along um, to try and, and accomplish and, and the problem sort of to solve. Um, so I will sort of kick it over to you, Monique, and, and go from there. Thank you. You kind of explain the next slide, oh. which is great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I said I was only going to do an intro. Didn't I? <laughs> I I was going to um, no. one on there. That's helpful. <laughs> so um, we're revisiting this. Um, you've seen this before. So if we start on the left side with that little blue, light blue circle, um, we started off our school year um, kind of formalizing and um, creating our citizens advisory committee and then moving into our objectives 
in the rectangle there where we first wanted to establish an understanding of the renaming process and then to really look at our namesakes and how they align with our um, assurances. And so with that, um, our committee members met, you know, we looked at the history, presented to the board, received feedback from our community, and there was kind of this um, cycle, right, between objective two and then that green circle where we're communicating with the board, where we, um, you know, went back to our committee and said, you know, what else can we do? How can we get people involved? What else do we need to know? Um, received more information from the community, um, just kind of this constant feedback loop um, to the, which brought us to a decision, right? And the board decided that all schools would be renamed. And so um, that um, eliminated that top path where the N is, right? So 3A is no longer applicable because all of our schools are going to be renamed. And so it takes us down to the Y, to the yes, the yes um, to objective 3B, where as Dr. Silvers mentioned, we're now exploring the type of name that we would like, um, and then eventually the actual name. And so that will take place um, through a, a similar process, right? Where our committee members meet, we receive feedback from our community, feedback from the committee, um, feedback from you, and then ultimately we would make that decision based on the recommendation from the committee and also the feedback from the community. Um, and then that bottom path there just takes us through the end where we're able to kind of um, provide justification for the different types of names that are selected, provide um, potentially options to our community, receive more feedback and um, provide another recommendation um, for you to make a decision. Next slide, please. So since that decision was made to rename all the schools, um, these are some of the steps that have been taken. Our renaming committee has met, um, our students have been engaged. Um, you'll hear some of the, um, the feedback from our students. And we've collected data. And along each of those steps, there's been communication to the community about the process, summaries, and the opportunity to um, provide us with some feedback. So our Citizens Advisory Committee met at the end of April um, for, there were two purposes, a couple of purposes. One was to just review what had been done so far to kind of celebrate all the work that had been done, um, show some appreciation. Um, to talk about the committee's purpose once more and kind of review on things that are going well, any suggestions that people have moving forward since we'll be taking a similar process um, to decide on the type of name and the actual name. And then to break out into smaller groups um, and each group was asked to ask a few questions. One, to define the different types of names, focusing on individual geographic and values or traits. And then there was a space for other in case anyone had any other ideas. Um, to define pros for each of those types, cons for each of those types, and then to list any questions or information we still might want to know as we're thinking about um, the different types of names. And so um, this is a summary of what the committee came up with in terms of individual pro and pros and cons related to the individual name type. Um, for pros, um, some of the feedback was um, it would be great to have a tangible person that students can look up to. Um, that can provide a positive example based on their history and things that they've done, someone who aligns with our PBIS expectations. Um, and then also, if we choose an individual as a name type, we'd have an opportunity to really commemorate someone who maybe hasn't been recognized um, in the past. But in terms of cons, um, an, an individual name type could potentially be polarizing. It would be difficult to find, to identify someone where everyone agrees that this is an exemplary person to name a school after. Um, no one's perfect, so it's, there's a high likelihood that anyone we find would have flaws. And then um, eventually that person could kind of become outdated where maybe something comes to light or that person kind of isn't seen in the same light as they were when we made the decision now. Next slide, please. In terms of geographic, um, some felt like it would increase awareness of our district. So people would better, might be better able to identify our schools with our location and, and our district of Wiseburn. Um, we could promote knowledge and um, of history. And then um, it just would provide us a chance to provide a, a unique name related to our district. 
in terms of cons. Um, some felt like it may be less personal to general. Some said it might be kind of the easy way out instead of really taking time to look through individuals or identify individuals. Um, some people might not feel um, like it's as inclusive and some felt like it might not link to our assurances. Well, you know, Dr. Ingram, I know we had a chance to discuss a little bit. Um, I think you were part of that discussion, but just an internal discussion talking about the assurances. So I, I think it, at, um, at one level, um, you know, there, there is a, an argument that the a geographic um, location could, could build on our assurances, especially when you start looking at um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that, you know, any person um, could cause or could be, uh, could not be accepting or acceptable to another, to another human being. But, you know, if you have a geographic location that sort of encompassing of the neighborhood, that maybe people would feel more included within this and not feel like a name, not feel opposed to, um, as they may if it was a person. So just something that, that was discussed in, in a small group. Um, also just the fact that, you know, just overall inclusion in the districts may uh, maybe increase a little bit. So um, obviously totally um, support that, that comment, but we did have some internal dialogue. Well, um, I probably didn't capture a great uh, money, yeah. but just wanted to. So that's a great point. So, so these reflect the notes as our committee members mentioned them. So there's room for interpretation and um, kind of further discussion to maybe think outside of the box or explore some of these points. Um, and then lastly, for values and characteristics, um, the pros that a value could easily represent our assurances. Um, and would could align with PBIS and also could potentially be less controversial. But on the other hand, um, focusing on one word could be limiting. Um, values, the, the word that's chosen might not be valued by certain cultures in the same way. And so there might be differences there. And then um, if we choose a value and maybe a student really isn't aligned with that value just yet, they're working on it, um, you know, that might be a challenge or something that's not seen as positive either. Um, okay, so that is what the Citizens Advisory Committee was working on. Um, they did participate in our survey and they voted as well um, for the students. They um, were presented with a five minute um, presentation and that presentation included information. Well, first it, it indicated that the schools are going to be renamed, talked a little bit about the process and what that looked like, um, a little bit about why the schools will be renamed and then invited them to participate in an optional um, kind of nomination form, right? Where younger students received um, the form that's furthest to the left, TK through second grade. Older elementary received the form that you see on the right side, and then middle schoolers um, um, filled out a Google form. So theirs was all electronic. Um, and the elementary school students received the information through assemblies. So it was presented to them um, either whole school or grade level. And then teachers were asked to follow up with them in the classroom and kind of have a discussion about renaming. And student council helped out with Dana's presentations in pod. So all students. Yes. All right. So let's take a look at those results. Okay. So we have 548 um, participants, and I've broken it down here by um, like in four groups. So you see that um, there were 17 committee members who responded to the survey, and those 17 attended our most recent meeting, compared to 10 um, committee members who were not able to attend the last meeting, but they they still participated in the survey. We have 77 non-committee members. So those are community members, our current parents, um, former parents, employees, community members, and then 445 students TK through eighth grade who wanted to participate in this process. You can see the number, the actual numbers represented in the table and the percentages represented in the pie chart. Oops. Okay, so, this represents um, all of those participants um, and their responses. So we see that for geographic and individual, they're about the same um, with a slight edge for geographic. Um, okay, next slide. This slide breaks it down by group. So if you look at just that first cluster, um, this represents everyone, the committee members, the community members and students. So we have 185 
um, 185 people who chose geographic compared to 176 who chose individual. If we just look at committee members who did attend um, our most recent meeting, the majority selected geographic location and then um, next up was individual. Oh, one back please, thanks. Um, if we look at committee members who didn't attend the meeting, um, similar outcome for the majority, but um, the second preference was a value or a characteristic. For our community members, those who are not on the committee, um, there is a, a big difference between those who wanted a, a, those who chose geographic versus individual. And then with the student nomination forms, we had um, 156 who selected an individual compared to um, 123 who chose geographic. Okay, next slide, please. This breaks the data down even further if you're interested just kind of in the demographics. So if we just, if we take out the students and we just look at committee members and community members, there are 103 participants and you can see the breakdown here by school um, where most are choosing um, geographic over individual or there's a tie between the two. So there's no particular school that has kind of a strong preference towards um, kind of one versus another. We see pretty much a similar pattern. Next slide, please. Um, similar, if we take those same 103 and break it down by their self-identified role for it with our community. So parents or caregivers with, of currently enrolled students, Wiseburn employees, um, participants who felt like they have multiple roles. Again, we see that um, the majority are choosing geographic um, over individual. In every case. Yes. All right, next slide, please. The difference is, sorry, it's very bright. <laughs> Um, the difference, there are a lot of differences when we look at the students and their choices. So of the 445, 269 of those um, were Dana students. Um, and we have whoop, 113 of them who um, chose an individual name. If we look at 138th Street, the most common choice was a value or a characteristic. A lot of them wanted to incorporate um, BEST, or a lot of votes for Bulldog BEST, and BEST is their PBIS acronym expectation, so they, they included that. For ANZA, you can see the most popular was OTHER. A lot of our ANZA students actually voted for ANZA. They, um, they wanted to keep it the same. And so, um, you know, as we move forward, we'll just need to do some work helping folks transition to this new name and um, kind of reiterating that we're holding on to the culture, right? And, and just changing the name. And then with Cabrillo, um, again, Other was very popular. Cabrillo had a lot of fun names. <laughs> well, they all had great names. Um, really thoughtful, um, really thoughtful individual suggestions, um, some really fun geographic suggestions. Um, and then it'll be, I think in a, in, a, in a later presentation, we'll provide some of the names and we can also share them with you. But you can really tell that students are relating the names to um, what's important to them, which is neat to see. Next slide, please. All right, so what are people saying? Um, if you think back to those pros and cons that our committee members came up with, the comments um, from our community survey reflected those pros and cons as well. So in the survey, participants are asked to identify the type of name that they would select, why they selected that type, and they had the opportunity to add a comment. And so the rationales that people provided um, really reflected the items that were in the pros and cons list that our committee members came up with. Um, there were several comments celebrating the decision to be to rename some, um, reflecting that they would choose to keep the current names. Um, I think it's important to note that the majority of the committee members selected geographical or geographical name, which is aligned um, with the community, right? So I think in some of our previous presentations, there was not alignment, but here we do see alignment. And then um, just in case you were wondering some of the examples of other students mm -hmm. suggested um, and adults, mascots, flowers, professional sports teams, animals. Um, my favorite, yeah. <laughs> um, a TK student from Cabrillo said it should be Bagrio because 
bear stars with B and they're the cubs. Um, and then some outside of the box thinking where people um, combined two of the types. So um, someone suggested Hawthorne Bright Elementary because the students are bright and the city is in Hawthorne. All right, now I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Silvers. So I think we're we're at, at the point. You know, I'd certainly like to hear some of the board's you know comments of a certain direction, uh, but just kind of thoughts from from staff as we've had a chance to see this to participate. I guess throughout the process with the CAC, um, just in light of, of the results, you know, looking to to potentially bring an action item to this board uh, at the May twenty sixth meeting. Is that right? That's an, that's the right. That's not the point. But twenty sixth meeting. Um, to consider utilizing a geographic name uh, for, so that we could then start activity three, uh, which it would be the, the actual selection of the name. I know that, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in kind of getting this, uh, getting this done, not from staff, but from the community, from the school sites that we're able to move on to that next phase um, of this process. And so just looking at the results, um, you know, and, and, and making the best educated decision or recommendation, I guess decision that we could just fill in like that may be the best um, best way to go of course uh, you know if we're in a new direction we may have new guidance so um, I don't know if you have anything to add but I guess we turn it over to the oh. trustee comments um, members? I, I just have a question about the timeline so on the 26th we make a decision about the direction to go are we what I, I think you guys may have mentioned this at the last board meeting but can you remind us like when would we actually see new names on the schools? Like, are we looking at that for the fall or are we looking at the next school year? If I can throw in one thing here, I think what, my, what Dr. Silvers is asking of us relative to this is if in fact we choose to go with the geographic name based on the results of it, the number one overall, that would expedite the process right. of moving to a new name. So I think that's in the answer to your question in some way, it depends in part by what we do here. I think that if, um, you know, and, and I don't want this to be the reason, obviously, but I would just say that if we're starting to look at people's names, you're looking at a process that would probably draw out another, I'm going to say, it could be six months, a year, months. even. Yeah. Um, if we go geographic, um, then yes, I mean, I think that you're, there's only a handful. I mean, at that point, you're looking at four names, five names, potentially, you know, eight. I mean, if there's some creative geographic areas or street names and things, uh, it could be happening. Could see it even as soon as next year. I don't think it would be registered with LACO or CDE by next year, but we could start re referring to names as a certain name by next year. Comments, thoughts? Uh, you know, thank you to all of the folks who participated in the process, the kids and the <laughs> and their adults. Um, and it's good to see that there was an uptick sort of in community feedback in this um, process. Um, but I mean, I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any hesitation about moving forward with the recommendation. Yeah, on my end, but um, I'm looking at the slide. Can can you put up slide? Uh, I guess that would be 16. I want to make sure I understand this correctly because I'm looking at the chart here, and as it relates to this, is the survey that was done by at the schools, and were these the votes of the students? Yes. So they were sorry, 16. Um, so there were two different um, pieces. The students. It's a school site submission. Yes. yes. So the middle school students, um, yes, they had a Google form. So it's like a survey format, right? That asked them um, what type of, or asked, so middle school students were asked, what type of name do you prefer? And for a suggested name. And then they were asked to explain why they chose that. And then the younger students were just asked, um, you know, what name would you choose and why? And then, um, and then those submissions were coded. So, so this is the students and the, the sites, right? Yes. So right now we're asked to look at individuals and geographic. And as far as the, at the school sites and the students, in every instance at every school site, students prefer individuals. Is that correct? I look at student nomination form Dana, 113 said individual and 89 said geographic. Yes, but then moving down to 138, the, the next black line. So 30 said individuals and 24 said geographic. Right. Oh, yeah. So if you're just comparing the two. Because at this point, I mean, the values, that's not, 
up for consideration now, right? There's some other ones, of course, right? There's a, there's that other column, right? Right. So, an, but then <clears throat> from the two, assuming that values and other are no longer to be considered, our students in every case at every school site said they prefer individuals. Right. More students did. Yeah, this is a this well, is the, a, the majority, right? This so is extrapolated from the previous slide, right? Look, look at 13, that shows everything. That's a yeah. slide 13 shows student. I agree, it still shows student, but shows everything. Okay. Yeah. Not this one. Yeah, this one. <laughs> right. right. So looking so at the, the, so right. the one on the left, so we're talking nine respondents of difference, right? The, the one on the left is totals. Yeah. Right. So, so it's so almost 50 50, right? Right. Okay. So in my opinion, I'd, I'd like to see an action item if that's going to be come forward for a review of individuals as well. I, I'm not convinced with geography. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're missing, we, if we would go geography, I think we're missing an opportunity to truly name a school over um, with regards to someone that really represents the values and which to me is what the students are asking for, a, a person that they can aspire to be like and see their uh, leadership abilities. Like I said, like I saw the last one, in every category, the students themselves are more for um, uh, for individuals. We just attended the uh, the uh, open house session, and at every school site, I saw on the walls. There's a beautiful uh, said that uh, uh, readers today and leaders tomorrow, and students did projects, and they were looking at individuals and people they can aspire to be like. I think it's an easy way out to go geography or something else versus an indi an, an individual. If it takes us, if it takes six months or a year, I think that's the right time to go ahead and do that. I wouldn't want to hold it back just because it's going to take longer. I would rather have a student that looks at an individual and dreams as to what they can be versus an area that has that could be pretty bland and not really uh, visionary. I, I mean, I looked at the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Supreme Court nomination hearing with uh, Judge Kitanji Brown and that wonderful picture with her daughter looking at her as she's waiting for the nomination. I would rather have our students look towards people like that than the geography that, I don't know. I mean, if there's only four or five, it doesn't, don't get me wrong. I love the wiser community in our area, but I just don't think it inspires leadership and inspires characteristics. I think it's bland, I think it's boring. Uh, <laughs> it's not gonna compel me to do more. I think, I think a name for me is much more aspirational and, and we're never going to, I would, I obviously do agree that we're never going to find a perfect person. But I don't think there, that one exists. So I don't think we should be looking for one that is, that, 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 that is perfect. And certainly future generations, if they so choose to, they can change the names of the schools as we're doing today, 40, 50 years from now. Uh, and for values that they believe they represent in their society and their community, there's nothing that says that these names will be there in perpetuity after all we're changing them. So I would, Personally, I'd prefer an individual name and really see that process. Uh, I guess, and, and as another option is maybe allow the students and uh, bring, bring and the community bring both names of both. If, if one school wants a geography and area and they think that's more self-identifying than an individual, bring them both forward. But because I, I look at that slide, and we're only nine points off as a whole. So, so just pick one off. I, I would recommend that we look at either both or, or actually go to individuals again because it's more aspirational. Thank you. Uh, you know, first of all, I appreciate the process. I appreciate the process. I, I think it's uh, it's wonderful. And I, I think that uh, definitely want to get more 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 feedback. Uh, I think you I've seen an uptick in terms of that. There's a, a part of me that agrees with Roger. There's a part of me that disagrees with Roger uh, because we've had the names of these individuals in our school, and I don't think anybody's aspired to be them, right? So, but that also could be because of the situation, right? Who knows? Um, what I do like is the process that you're going through. I like the fact that we're getting feedback and input from the community, the students, and the teachers. And perhaps now I think what we've done is narrowed it down where it's, it seems like the, the importance is. It, it, it's it, it's narrowed it, it between geographical and, and individual, and I'm going to be one that supports what, whatever ultimately at the end of the day that the, the community, the students at large, really wish and desire. So that's kind of where I've been at. I think from the very beginning of this, so 
Um, but I'm, I'm, I just appreciate the, 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 the input that we're getting from the community. I think that's what's going to ultimately drive it in whatever names I think we will be happy with it as a, as a community, as a school. And so forth. Um, it's a difficult choice. I am, uh, I appreciate Roger, your comments. I, I find the goal of diversity, equity, inclusion, the goal of consistency among our schools, the goal of not feeling to disenfranchise anybody because they don't identify with the person actually more compelling than trying to find someone that will appeal to many. So to me, I'm, I find the geographical references the most logical answer. I don't see it as a cop out. I see it as a way to celebrate our unique uh, geography. And I would encourage us to pursue that. I think what we're hearing on the board though is not that consensus. So I wanna honor that. Um, so I think Dr. Silvers, you have our respective views, which means continue the process. All right, any other things to present Dr. Silvers? Uh, four more things here. <laughs> <laughs> moving on no we're uh, we're good i have nothing further thank you all right we're moving out to start our agenda i know also let me uh give some cover to miss hamburg she has an event this evening and will need to depart shortly after eight o'clock we want to honor that respect that don't feel awkward you need to do what you have to do so if you need to go just do your thing we will move to action items general, approve maximum candidate statement, word limitation, and payment policy 6.1 and 6.2, approve resolution 21-22-27, ordering governing board member election. Uh, can I have a motion for these? Yeah, motion. Thank you very much. Second. Uh, we put these together because they're both relative to the upcoming election as we have three board members who are, will be up for election. We need to approve that and limit the words as we have always done in the past. Any comments or questions? Subaki, uh, call a question, please. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Eight. Item 6.3, rejection of claims against the district. A motion, please. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Dr. Silvers. <coughs> Wendy, do you want to just give a little bit? Um, um, this is just a, a claim that was presented to the district, um, and this is our process of uh, we're bringing, bringing this up to the board. And I think in this case, we need to be a little bit cognizant. There's some confidential, There's confidential some information. And, and um, but that this would this would allow the insurance company then to take the lead on it. And the district would would defer to their investigation and their, you know, uh, whatever process that the insurance company goes through, we would then defer to them. So this we is have, the right thing. We have been briefed on this. We want to advise that this is, again, confidentiality. You want to respect the personal identifiable information and not share that. Um, this is a big picture. Call a question. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Let's move now to 6.4. 6.4, honoring our teachers, both Teacher Week this past week and California Day of the Teacher, uh, the uh, 19th, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, oh, the 11th. That's Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. Is, um, SLP. That's, that's right. That's right. Uh, I need a motion to adopt 21 slash 22 point 25. Happy to motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Do we want to read this uh, resolution? Um, I can just. I can't not gonna be able to read it from there, Wendy. So I'm gonna. Have to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's possible. Well, that's I, not, I, I, that's great. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to read it from this little screen here in front of me. But <laughs> um, all right. So. Uh, <laughs> Weiser Unified School District Resolution Number Twenty One uh, Slash Twenty Two. Point twenty five, California Day of the Teacher. Whereas the state of California is fortunate to have a team of skilled, caring educators who during the current unprecedented global pandemic have taken on the role of essential workers, making it possible for students to continue to learn during this uncertain time. And whereas Wiseman Unified School District teachers are dedicated to making a positive difference in the lives of our students. And whereas Wiseman teachers instill in our students a love of freedom and democracy, an appreciation of the richness of cultural diversity, an understanding of the lessons of history, a respect for the environment, and the skills to pursue productive careers. And whereas Weisburn teachers, while facing personal and professional challenges, 
work tirelessly to provide student instruction through distance learning. And whereas Wiseman teachers have been responsible for educating thousands of students since the district's founding and have led efforts to promote and advance educational opportunity for all. And whereas Wiseman teachers have promoted the value of public education and advocated for the resources necessary to maintain high quality schools and colleges. And whereas, sorry, the recognition that the Wiseburn community gives to teachers also influences the attitudes of students and society toward public education. And whereas California's annual Day of the Teacher will be observed in California schools on May 11, 2022. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wiseburn Unified School District Board of Trustees joins the California legislature and the Association of Mexican American Educators in, procl in proclaiming Wednesday, May 11, 2022, the day of the teacher. Thank you to our teachers. Uh, you are the most important cog in the wheel of education. Without you, none of this happens. Thank you so very much. 6.5, adopt resolution number 21 slash 22.26, proclaiming the week of May 15 through 21, 22 as classified school employees week. Motion, please. All right. Motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Sure. All right. Wise, Wiseburn Unified School District Resolution Number uh, 21 dash or, or slash 22.26 Classified School Employees Week. Whereas the California public schools employee employ approximately 240,000 classified staff, about half of who are in full time positions and about half in part time positions. Whereas many classified employees, perhaps the largest share, serve in paraprofessional capacities most provide, providing direct assistance to certificated faculty in the classroom and giving students the type of individual attention and support they need to succeed academically. Whereas other classified employees perform vital clerical and office support functions without which, school, without, without which local school sites, as well as district and regional headquarters simply could not operate. And without which many students would not receive important educational and health related services. Whereas still other classified employees are involved with cafeteria and other nutrition related programs, serving California students many millions of meals and snacks each year, which enable those students then to focus their attentions on learning, not on hunger pains. Whereas many classified employees perform custodial services, ensuring that thousands of school buildings and grounds statewide are clean, safe, and well maintained, and that thus the public's substantial investment in these facilities is protected, whereas efficient and effective support and ancillary services are essential ingredients to enable excellent teaching, sound administration, and high achievement by students, whereas the State Board of Education's mission is to create strong, effective schools that provide a wholesome learning environment through incentives that cause a high standard of student accomplishment as measured by a valid, reliable accountability system and a strong system of classified service in public schools is critical to that mission's realization. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wiseburn Unified School District Board of Trustees officially recognizes the contributions of the members of the classified staff to providing an outstanding school system for the students and hereby, and hereby proclaims May 15th through 21st, 2022 as Classified School Employees Week. Thank you, indeed. Well, CSA members, uh, you have been asked, just like our teachers, to do more than ever this year. You have stepped up. Thank you for your care for our schools, for our students, and for each other. We really appreciate you. Thank you. I did not ask for a vote on 6-4 and 6-5. Thank you, Roger, for pointing that out. Uh, let's vote on both of these together, please. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All in favor? Thank you. 6.6, .6, approved supervised fieldwork agreements between Wiseburn and Loyola Marymount University. Motion, please. Oh, motion as long as Blake's on the roll. I like the, the, can you read the agreement? <laughs> <laughs> I need a second, please. I'll second with Dr. B. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, questions or comments? This is our standard relationship agreement. Call question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? 
6.7, we separated this because it needs it's new this year. Approved contract for services with informed K-12, a software program that supports workflow processes for school districts. Motion, please. So motion. Thank you. Second. Dr. Silvers, if you take us through this, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited, uh, you know, that, that it was brought to, brought to us. I know Greg had a, a recommendation that we review this, that we look at, at this as a workflow system um, and, a, and also as a form, uh, sort of a form warehouse, but with a purpose. I mean, I, I don't know how, the, how it's best to describe it. Uh, really could change the face of how business happened, how the flow of business happened, both in human resources, I think, to support, you know, Nisha and her department, uh, as well as in the business services um, side of the house and then potentially may have some outreach to other areas as, as we become more familiar with it but just um you know really really um intrigued i guess from by this this opportunity to to do some um, some systems building within the district and, and also something that the board has has um, asked for probably for four years probably before that is this idea of signature authority and spending authority and and this will help outline a little bit more clearly how that how that looks in the district. Um, so so really excited to, to potentially bring this um, bring this back and certainly cabinet is fully supportive of this um, and and excited to get to work. Any questions from the board? I saw in the in the description of the program that said it has the potential for being used for permission slips. Is that something that you're actually looking at to Move those things deeper. <laughs> yeah, the, the goal would be to to do that. I think that's a very simple fix um, and something you can do easily. And it's signature, legal signatures, are like legal electronic signatures, um, unli unlimited. I guess I, I'm messing my words up here. You get unlimited legal signatures electronically through this program. Um, so, you know, DocuSign type, type uh, service, but not DocuSign. Uh, so, so it allows us to do that and then store it and just look at a dashboard as to who submitted it. So yes, to answer your question, yeah, sorry for the roundabout answer. I, I'm excited about this. It provides, as I understand, efficiencies, automation, tracking, help us better workflow process for sure. Yeah. Let's call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Item, final item 6.8, proof summer school 2022 waiver of the state deal mandate. This was pulled from our prior, uh, Mr. Manuelas, you'd asked the question. Uh, I want to share my understanding here is that um, because it's offered at Bel Air Park, we actually are getting access to all the students without us having to worry about the logistics and cost of that, which I think addresses your concern as I understand it uh, and makes me feel better as well. And I'm saying that we need a motion first. <laughs> is, that, is that through our county or city? Or? It is through the county in partnership with, with the district. And actually, you know, we've done this for, for several years. I, you know, I'm sorry I didn't bring that up, you know, the last time. I know Eileen had mentioned it in passing, um, but should have mentioned it at the last meeting, and I apologize. I appreciate the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's great. I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve. Great. Yeah. Second. Thank you. Yes, and I did want to thank uh, Dr. Harvick for looking into that. We, we also don't want to take it for granted. What if the county, for some reason, that year decides not to hold it? Or provide the meals, right? So thank you for the due diligence and checking. Primary concern, making sure our students, to your comment earlier, uh, don't go hungry while they're while they're present. So thank you for taking a look at it, for pulling it, and then coming back to us and looking at this as, uh, as the option. Thank you so much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Move to facilities. Seven point run, ratifying agreement with SBA Architects for the CTE Studio Project. Motion, please. For Roger on this one. <laughs> motion. 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 I'll second. Thank you. I believe Dr. Silvers, you have a brief overview for us. I, you know, yeah, I, I think that um, actually, can we bring up the the item here on the screen? Particularly the picture, Wendy. I think that um, that was that's probably the best the best way to look. But you know, this has been uh, sort of a long time coming, and, and I know SBA had been been partners in this process and, and have been to for quite a bit of time and energy into a program and a well, facilities program here, a, a small facility here that's going to help reduce just immense gain. So, I mean, I think what this could provide for the community, uh, the, the fact that our middle schoolers will hopefully look up to this as, as, a, as a really a, a standalone, a standout, not standalone, a standout program uh, is really uh, something that we're excited about. So, looking here, uh, basically, you could see the, the light blue box there to the, oh, let's say it's the, the west side uh, of the building. So we're looking up would be north, down would be south, and we have uh, to the left as well. 
west mm -hmm. and, and east. So to the to the west are that light blue building uh, does impact one of the one of the basketball courts, which is um, but then in phase two, you know that basketball that basketball court will be replaced. You can see that there in the next uh, rendering um, as the red would outline the new basketball court. Um, I do I, I do want to note that while it's taking up some grass area, actually by that point the soccer field. Um, you know, knock on wood, will be will be built, so there will be an extended use of that soccer field and in, in quasi grass area. So it's, it's, it it won't encroach into the soccer field. It will not. No, 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 that's would be for the south. Yeah. yeah. And then, would you show us option item three? Yeah. And was this an option, or was that this is all phase two? Yes. So that would just be another. So if you notice, go up one more. It was pointing to side two, just so that. So I mean, just kind of taking a snapshot of this, and you can see the shop is to the. To the east of the of the light blue building, you see the, the basketball courts there up to the north. And then if you go back to that next iteration, it has the shop that's more adjacent to that piece of the facility, and then to the basketball court, basketball court to the to the, the east there of the light blue um, structure. So it's just two different layouts uh, so that we would need as a facility to make it to determine that. As I understand it, that we are not approving two or three at this point, because that is phase two. Right. We're simply approving that this will go forward with right. phase one, which we see on the first slide. And then the options of two and three should funding become available. Right. And that doesn't change, right? So as you noted, Dr. Goldman, that the light blue box there, it doesn't change in either of them. So that would be the focus right now. Right. Worth pointing out that as both the <coughs> soccer field and the CT studio is being mentioned, this is all funded by our partners at Da Vinci not encroaching on our budget in any way, right. and uh, we're merely approving the, the ability to do that, and then we manage the project. And I also like, would like to thank the facilities committee with uh, Da Vinci and the and the SVA architects for working working together with the, this creative solution here of a phased approach, because as we all know, construction costs and inflation is uh, it's high, <laughs> it's high right now. So by having a phased approach, is still allows for the project to remain viable and move forward for the benefit of the students that are going to be using it as opposed to canceling the entire project you know because funds are limited so i, I really would like to commend the, the working group because they thought creatively to move forward in phases and as funding becomes available they can build another component of it um, and this is a, also a very good scenario in the sense that it does not encroach in that seating area, that amphitheater area that we have there. Thank you for the for the highlight. Uh, there's also a lot of utilities in that area. So th this process is also one of the most, uh, from given the options and where it's the best location, it's actually one of the most economical situations to eliminate rework of, <laughs> and having to demolish a certain area, redo it, and then relocate utilities. So uh, it was a very thorough process that ended up with this phase approach. So I wanted to commend the working group. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger, and thank you because I know you've been involved in, in guiding Da Vinci Air too in the past. And me as well, by the way. And you know, really <laughs> been helpful in terms of contracts and understanding, uh, you know, our con the contracts that we're looking at really from a from a, a detailed perspective. So thank you, Roger, for doing that. Yeah, the the uh, the value of having two experts yeah. in in. Uh, Facilities is just uh, incomparable. I appreciate both of you coming. Well, he, he's got more time than I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, let's, uh, let's take a vote. Here. Hours <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Item 7.2, resolution 21 slash 22.28, emergency resolution to approve entering into a contract for unexpected pool heater replacement at Aquatic Center pursuant to public contract code sections 20113 and 1102. I'm not reading that again. <laughs> uh, this was the emergency resolution to expedite the process for moving the pool forward so we get the pool back open and running. Uh, any comments or questions here? I know Roger, you've been involved here as well. Uh, go ahead. Um, no, uh, no new comments. Make the comments earlier under uh, uh, Dr. Silver's Blake's uh, comments there with regards to the pool. I do think it's necessary though to move it forward to help us expedite the process. Thank but you. To, with that, I'll make a motion. motion thank you. Good second. Thank you very much. Hearing no comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Wendy, I'm sorry. I should have said this. We need to roll call vote. Oh, oh yeah, this is a uh, special yeah. emergency. Uh, Mr. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Ben Lillo? Aye. Mr. Kaplan? Aye. And Dr. Bolton? Aye. You know, within the minutes, I was told we need to note that um, 
Miss Canetta is, is, is absent today, so the four O's unanimous. Moving to action items fiscal, if someone is so inclined, I believe we can take these together. I'll um, move. You'll move what? Uh, one, eight, one through eight, six. Thank you. And I'll second eight, one through eight, six, but just a, one comment, the young, the young little man that came in here to do a presentation approached us at the um, Rock Around the Block event to say uh, thank you for you know allowing him to present. And it sounds like there's been some changes in, at, the, at the 138 school uh, with the lunch program. So that, that has to do a lot with obviously that little young man doing a wonderful presentation. So I, I don't remember his name, but um, I, I'm, I'm assuming Blake too that's yeah. Dylan some improvements. Uh, Dylan. Yeah. Dylan. Uh, so he actually came in and thanked us at the at the made round. It happen. Good yeah. Yeah. And we also um uh, sorry. Okay. We also did have uh, some comments about vegan vegan meals, and there was a student who had had supported wanted us to take a look at vegan options. And I know uh, Michael has worked. Michael actually was here. Michael Gingler from Chartwells mm -hmm. spent some time with Dylan. Um, also now spent I get cookies, you know, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, Michael, thank you for for doing that. Um, sure. That's been uh, you know so because I did receive. I, the reason I said that is because um, uh, her the daughter and, and her mother approached me at the Cabrillo back to school night and was thankful for the fact that you know her daughter she doesn't have to make lunch because at least on on, on these days she knows that there's going to be a meal for her and she'll feel a lot she could feel good for her. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the kid. I think it's extremely important that we certainly consider their their input, especially you know when it, when it's their lunch day to day. We want to make sure they're fed well and that obviously impacts their education. So thank you. I also want to note here, Dr. Goldman, that uh, there's a couple items to note. 8.4 is actually an approval of the contract extension with um, with Chartwells, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I just want to share that you know as, as we saw, you know Michael was really involved in this process. You know, overall we've just been very happy with Chartwells and their and their service to the district, um, their attention to the detail, um, the running of a really solid program, and, and good food. You know that um, our students generally are very um, happy with. And, and excited to eat lunch um, at the school. So um, thank you, Michael, for that too. And I just wanted to note that you know, on the agenda, this is a, a big deal. School food is a big deal, right? right. And, and, and this is uh, an important- It's a big budget item too. I it know. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've been a good partner. Well, I appreciate that too. And uh, I know that you've also been supportive of the of Rock Around the Block each year, helping to provide uh, some of the stuff. Well, no, and then- yeah. uh, Fruits and vegetables yeah, and right. things like that. It's been it's been really lovely to, to have that partnership yeah, too. Yeah. Thank you. I also had a comment on eight point two. If you could pull that up, I'm I just found the numbers. They're not huge numbers, but just kind of be diligent, fiduciarily responsible. That's the word. Um, I don't understand why uh, one thirty eight and Cabrillo are almost as much as and individually. It just seems like those numbers. Add up to me. This is a long. Thank you for asking. This is a long-standing subscription that was um, bargained, for lack of a better word, years ago, and um, so we've we've continued it year after year with ST Math. It's popular with our young students. All day. Oh, I have no problem with ST Math. I, I just didn't understand why uh, both. But yeah, the cost by by both 138 and Cabrillo are basically 80 percent of ANZA each. It has to do, you know, it has to do with the agreement that was made and how much, um, how many teachers we have. I think it might be based on the teachers. I can go back and look at that. Well, isn't it that it's based on enrollment, I think. It's based on enrollment, right. but if you add, I know what you're saying, if you add Cabrillo and, um, and uh, 138, you're up to just over almost a thousand children. Right. So, so that would be five. more. So he answers about half that, about 5.5. All right, so then and also more teachers. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. All right, just, it just struck me as worth asking. Sorry so thank you. Any other comments on 8.1 eight, eight, through 8.6? Aye. 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 Action items consent 9.1 through 9.4. If someone wishes to yeah, make a motion, 9.1 through 9.4. Thank you. I'll second 9.1 through 9.4. Questions or comments, either from the board or the cabinet. Pretty straightforward. Wendy? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? 
Finally, item action item 10.1, approve unpaid leave of absences for 2022-23 school year. This reduces our number of shared teaching assignments from what was, I think, 10 just a couple years ago down to three, um, which is a goal of the board and uh, appreciate the work there and the teachers participation and cooperation. Need a motion? No. Thank you. Need a second? So is this to approve an unpaid leave of absence? I, mean, I guess I'm not understanding. Because they're not working full time, but. Correct, so this is the job share assignments. Um, so the teacher, these teachers take a 20% leave and then we backfill it with a 20% teacher. And one so of these is 50-50, right? And one's a 50-50. So how does that reduce the job shares? It sounds like someone's still part-time. We just the, the sheer numbers. We only have three left across the district now. Which is these three? Yeah. Okay. So this is to continue these. Correct. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I understand that. I wasn't sure how that was going to reduce yeah. it. Each Got year, it. each year we do have to bring it to the board. Um, any any sort of unpaid leave does ha does have the right to board approval, and so we do bring those every year to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, actually, I think that probably wasn't. Not, not not appropriate, but it just wasn't. It didn't it didn't address. Not necessary. Not necessary. Not necessary. Not necessary. All right, Wendy, let's take a vote, please. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. This takes us to our upcoming events. We have closed session notation here. We do need a brief closed session for board members to remain. However, upcoming dates and events. Can we post those? Yes. Yeah. Well, there we go. We are looking into replacing the screen. All right. So, Hands of School Family Dance Night, May 11th. Woohoo. Uh, we have a board workshop on May 26th, regular board meeting on May 26th, Memorial Day, May 30th, which is a day off for everyone, I believe. And uh, again, we're going to take a look at that June 9th board meeting, I believe. We'll take a look at the June 9th. And then, and then the next board meeting will actually have quite a bit of, you know, end of year activities uh, yeah. on here as well. And, you know, I'll try and make sure that we get those to you as, as soon as we have them solidified so that way you can start planning now. Perfect. Thank you. Are there questions or comments at this time? We've actually gone through our agenda. Thank you all for coming. This ends our meeting this evening. We are adjourned.